we've been in a sermon series basically since this, the beginning of the year on breakthrough. Um, and just very brief recap, we started the, the calendar year looking at actually our new members material. And from there, coming right out of that, out of our 21 days of prayer and fasting in January, we, I, I sensed the Spirit saying, this is the year for breakthrough. And just as a reminder, one of the things we've talked about this entire year is that just because the Father, in other words, the Father may speak to your heart and say, hey, this is the area of breakthrough. But if you do not step into that breakthrough and you don't walk in obedience to the Father, then it doesn't make a difference what the Father has told you he wants to do in your life. It's not going to happen if you don't walk in obedience. Okay? So the Father can speak all day long saying, this, I, I want good things for you. I want breakthrough for you. But if you rebel and say, I'm not going to walk in it, then guess what? We're not going to experience it. I also have sensed this entire year, this is the year of breakthrough for our church as well. I really think that the greater days are in front of us than there are behind us. And yet at the exact same time, if we don't choose to step into doing what is necessary for breakthrough to happen, then breakthrough is not going to happen. So the first portion of this calendar year, we were looking at, at different aspects of breakthrough that were more like individualistic. In other words, these are things that are, that are applicable to you. Now, they are applicable to the church as a whole, but they were very much more focused on you. Well, when we finished up you know, mid-July there, I said, okay, now we're going to turn our focus towards the church itself, and let's examine what is necessary for the church. Now, again, the, the truths are also applicable to us individually, but we're now speaking more directly to the church. And so a couple weeks ago, we started a, a, a brief sermon series in, in this section on breakthrough called Breakthrough Honesty. Breakthrough Honesty. And what this has been all about is we've been working ourselves through a book by Tom Rainer called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And where this all begins and where, where I sense this comes from is really out of the book of Revelation. Out of Revelation chapter 2. I think that the issue that we find within the autopsies of these deceased churches, it really comes down to what we see in the church, um, the letter to the church of Ephesus found in the book of Revelation. So let me, let me read these words to us and then just briefly mention what we've covered so far and then jump into these last three elements or last three evidences of a deceased church that were found in these autopsies. So starting here in Revelation, Revelation 2, starting there in verse 1, uh, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, you can reach forward and grab that Bible in the pew back in front of you. Uh, you can turn to page uh, 190 in the New Testament, and that's where we're going to be. And if you do not own a Bible, we would love for you to take that Bible with you as a gift from us because we want everybody reading the Word of God. So reach forward, grab that, page 190 in the New Testament. So starting there again, Ephesians, I mean Revelation 2, to the church of Ephesus, we read these words. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have per, uh, perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. And here's, and here's the whole focal right here, verse, verse 4. But I have this against you. And it is my presupposition personally that this is the issue with every one of these 14 churches that were autopsied by Tom Rainer. That you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let him who overcomes, to, to him who overcomes, excuse me, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The whole issue here, and, and what we've and we've used this verse 4 as our, our focal verse over these last couple of weeks is we're saying, okay, if we're going to understand breakthrough honesty, we're going to evaluate the situation of, of First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, but as well as 90% of churches in the United States, we need to be honest about the situation. As we indicated, that 40% of churches are sick. 
In other words, five or six of these ten elements that, that we've been discussing are evident in those churches, and those churches are, are sick. Then there are those churches that are very sick, and they've got seven or eight of these attributes. And I'm going to tell you, just my personal opinion as our pastor, we fall somewhere in this range between uh, sick or very sick, but we're in here somewhere. Then there are those churches that are actually dying churches, and this is 10%. So you had 40% that were sick, 40% that are very sick, and 10% that are actually in the dying phase. And they've got nine or 10 of these attributes that we've, we've been discussing. All right? And the reality is, is that if we don't ex step into obedience, we will eventually just find ourselves just moving further and further along to where we eventually have nine or ten of these things evident within the life of our church as well. And then eventually those doors just close. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we need to have breakthrough honesty about our situation. And whatever the situation is, and again, individually, corporately, we have to be honest about where we are. And if we're not honest about where we are, there's no way we're ever going to experience breakthrough. But we've got to acknowledge it, say it, address it, say it, publicly announce it, say this is where we are. And, if, and, then, and, then, and the reason, and again, the reason, I think the reason is because I think most of these churches, they didn't mean to, they're not even certain when it happened, but they lost their first love for Jesus. Because when you're passionately in love, and we talked about this even last week during the invitation time afterwards, and I, and I shared with you guys just about when I started, uh, I'm looking for it, when I started you know, dating Christy and when I tried to pursue her and she was like saying no, and no, and no, y'all remember that part of the, the, the sermon last week, right? Because yes, that's all that many of y'all remember because several of you came up and told me and said, I really like Christy a whole lot more now, you know? Thank you, by the way, for that, that rousing spirit of affirmation that you all gave Christy. Um, Christy, did it, by the way, I didn't even ask, did anyone come up to you and tell you they appreciated you more or did they just do it to me? You plead the fifth. You plead the fifth, Okay. Yeah, so, so but, the, the, but the point being, though, is when I was pursuing Christy, it was like, oh, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I'm going to pursue Christy. And I'm telling you, beloved, this is the way a lot of times when we come to know Christ Jesus for the, you know, and, and enter into a relationship with him, that's the way it is for many of us. We're like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe what has, what has happened to me. I can't believe that I went from literally from death to life. I, I, I went from being bound and subject to sin and headed toward the destination of the lake of fire. And now I'm redeemed, I'm freed, I've experienced the salvation found in Christ Jesus and him alone. And now there's this joy that's in me. There's this peace that's in me. And I can't wait to tell other people about that. And when that happens, there's just this overwhelming, contagious spirit that gets within us. And we're just like, oh, I got to tell people about Jesus i got to tell them about what Jesus did for me. By the way, beloved, you don't have to have all of the answers. You do not have to have every one of these pages memorized. You know what a testimony is? A testimony is you just telling another person your experience. In other words, you go to a court of law and you get a person in the witness stand and, and you, they say, do you, t t uh, do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? It, it's, yes, this is my testimony to what I know of the questions you're asking me about this particular situation. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know what your testimony is. This is what my life was like before I met Christ. This is how I came to know I needed Christ. This is what I did to receive Christ. And here is what my life is like now that I have Christ. That's a testimony. And every single one of us should be prepared in season and out of season to be able to give a response for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And if we really are in love with Christ Jesus, this is what we're going to want to do. Not have to do, not obligated to do. Now granted, it is, you are commanded to do this. But, you're not, but it's not out of obligation anymore. It's out of, I get to do this now. This is what the Spirit of Christ does within us. But when we fall out of love with Christ, when we forget our first love, it then does become a chore. It does become a burden. It does become a weight. And fear does grip us. And Satan lies to us. And we buy into those lies. And when that happens, that's when you start to see the death of a church. To where they become sick, then they become very sick, and then they become dying. All right? And so we've been looking at these things. So, so let's, let's look. Just They're in your bulletin there. If you want to pull out your bulletin, your, your listening guide. We're not going to preach through these. I just want to mention them and then move right into to the, the eighth one. 
These are the evidences of a deceased church. This is what was found in the autopsy. There was slow erosion. There was the, the past is the hero. The church refused to look like the community. The budget moved inwardly. The Great Commission becomes the Great Omission. The church becomes the preference-driven church. And pastoral tenure decreases. Now, if you want to uh, watch those sermons, they are online. You can go to our church's website, fbcbgfl.com fbcbgfl.com there's a link there that says sermons you can click it and you can go down and you can watch all of our sermons since like 2017 all right so now let's jump this week let's jump this week into these last three parts and this first one's where we're going to spend the most time uh, because of the fact that we're going to we're going to spend some time here okay hey it just dawned on me you guys know this is this is true of me i'm really bad at this kind of stuff um Janice actually asked me to give an, uh, 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 an update on the announcements, and it just now hit me that I didn't do that at the start of the sermon. So, so we're going to take a commercial break, okay? We're going to take a, this, is why, this is why I don't do announcements, you guys. This is, this is why. Um, commercial break. Uh, I am the one that gave Kim the announcements to read, and this, again, this is why I don't give announcements to read either. I gave her wrong information. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know, shocker of shockers, Okay. The August trip, has the tickets have already been purchased and set. So the, there's no spots left for the August trip, okay? But the October trip still has some slots. So if you're interested in going in October with Christy's trip, then you need to sign up, okay? And uh, you can see Christy or Kim or Janice certainly don't see me uh, because it's going to go, go nowhere with that, Okay. Uh, also, a, a second one, a second announcement that I was supposed to also have mentioned is that in the back, in the foyer there, in the, in the Narthex foyer, whatever you guys want to call it, uh, there is some information about Love Loud. Love Loud. In the month of August, for the last few years, we've been, this is the month that we hold Love Loud for the Hardy Help Center. We as a church, we give out of our tithes and offerings regularly to Love Loud. I mean, uh, to, to the Hardy Help Center, excuse me. And that's the way that, we, like, for example, for, for outside of our church, like if people come to us for assistance, we send them to the Hardy Help Center. So as a result, we say, hey, we want to support them. And so we give dollars every single month to the Hardy Help Center. But if indeed in the month of August, what happens is we say, okay, we want to just, we want to even above and beyond what we as a church normally give, we want to express even more love to our community, more love to the ministry of, of Hardy Help Center for what they do. And so as a result, in the back, there are cards, and you can go by and you can grab. There's, there's two cards on each clip. One is for you to fill out and keep. One is for you to fill out and leave there so that we can turn it into the Hardy Help Center. And there's different things that you can do. There's things you can purchase, like cleaning supplies or other things like that. But there's also volunteer things that you can do for them. Um, and there's other, there's a lot of things back on those cards. I'm not going to try to go through the list. So you go back there, you grab those cards, see which ones you want to do. Also throughout this month, you can give an offering to the, the Hardy Help Center and it will be above and beyond. So if you want to, uh, if you do it online, just ma click there, love loud. If you write a check, write love loud, put it in there. And this extra funds we will send to the Hardy Help Center. Okay. And so this is just a way for us to love on them for what they do within our community even more. And so that's why we call it Love Loud. Okay. So we've been doing this for the last several years and, and this is our month to do that. So you're going to hear this every single week. You're going to hear an advertisement about Love Loud. Okay. Now I think I've, the commercial break is over and now we can jump right back into where we were. So number eight, number eight in your listening guide, the church rarely prayed together. The church rarely prayed together and what i mean by that i am not talking about um you know let's 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 take prayer requests and the only prayer requests that we get are the infirmities and the brokenness of of, of people's bodies and ailments is it wrong to pray for those things you've heard me preach on this for a number, number of times is it wrong to pray for people in their sickness no no but if you really want to know how to pray for people in their sickness, go back to my sermon series that I preached last year at this time period in August and September and October. You want to learn how to pray for people who are sick? Go there. Because that's how you really ought to be praying for people who are sick. 
and not the way that we normally pray for people who are sick. Because the way that we pray for people who are sick is like going to the Father and going, oh, Lord, if it be genie in the bottle, your will to do this thing for us, would you please? And then we just keep praying the same prayer for everybody every single time. And nothing ever changes. No, you don't, you don't, we don't see the people get, get healed. We don't see the people get better. A lot of times. A lot of times. They just endure through it. And we just keep praying for them. So if you want to know how to pray for somebody that's sick, go listen to last, last year's sermon series on that time period, okay? But having said that, that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what this particular point is. So let's come back to Rainer for a moment. Rainer, again, I'm not going to keep saying his name over and over again, but these are the things. When you see me grab this book and I, you see me reading, it's, I'm, re, I'm quoting Rainer. Most of the churches, almost to the day they shut the doors, had some type of prayer meeting. It may have been a part of the worship services. It may have been with some type of fellowship, like a Wednesday evening meal. When this question was asked, all the participants of the autopsy said, answered, sure, we prayed together. The answer came in, an, in, uh, in unanim <laughs> unanimity, but not with, with excuse me, with unanimity, <laughs> totally, but not with enthusiasm. <laughs> this is a tongue. I'll get it out one day. Everybody agreed. They, we all, yeah, we spoke. We prayed. But they did it with, un, with, with no enthusiasm. When asked to describe the prayer time, something like the following was answered. Carl would pass the prayer list, and one person would have the blessing and pray for those on the list. Then we'd eat. Wow. The next question asked was, do you really think that was the meaningful time, that was a meaningful time of prayer? Do you think that's how the New Testament churches prayed? Inevitably, there would be a pause and then an admission. No, they said. It was more like a routine or a ritual. Not coincidentally, prayer and the health of the church went hand in hand. When the church is engaged in meaningful prayer, it becomes both the cause and the result of greater church health. And the passage of Scripture that Rainer took us to in his book was Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read these words. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. But I want you to note, it's, it's, the, it's the first part, though, that's most important. What did they do? They continually devoted. They continually devoted. In, in other words, this was not just a, the, the casual, oh, all right, let's pray for Sister Sue's bursitis. That's not what this was about. This was intentionality. This was with forcefulness. This was us as the, as the children of God coming before the throne room of God with, as John tells us, with the confidence, with the confidence that we as believers in Christ Jesus have to enter into the throne room of God. And the focus of prayer, of you look at this New Testament church, you just start reading through. Go read Paul's letter to the church of, uh, of Philippians. To the church of Philippi. You read that church's letter. And when you start reading that church, you start to see how Paul is praying. And how he prays and how he asks them to pray for himself. You, you read about him in the, like the, church of, uh, the church of Ephesus and the letter that he wrote to them. And the type of prayer he's praying for them and the type of prayers he's asking them to pray for him. I mean, this is a guy who has been in prison. And when he's writing to the church of Philippi, do you ever see him say, Oh, by the way, pray that I get released. Do you ever see any of that kind of stuff? You do not. What do you see him focusing on? The proclamation of the gospel. 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 That is the focus. It is the number one issue. You do not see him. You do not even see him. And you, Look, you guys have heard me do this one numerous times. I am a patriot. I love our nation, but I do not worship our nation. And some of us pray more for the United States of America than we do for the lost souls that are heading to the lake of fire. 
And even if we do pray for the souls that are heading to the lake of fire, we do that with more flippancy than we do with the intentionality that we pray for, for this nation to turn back. Let me just tell you guys, I've already said this before. This is me, this is me, this is me as, a, as an individual. You can stone me later on. I do not think, this is me, this is not First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, this is not indictment of First Baptist Church, this is not our philosophy at First Baptist, this is me, Scott Tharp. I don't know if the United States of America can be recovered in the current situation. Without Christ Jesus' intervention, I don't see there's a recovery for our nation. Okay? That's me. All right? Now, if, if, you, if you hold to that same kind of belief structure, then you don't be praying for the United States to repent or, or to turn. What you pray for is for the boldness of the church to rise up and start evangelizing. Because the only way you're going to put political uh, p p politicians in that are actually saved, I mean truly saved, and not puppeteer Christians, truly born-again people, is that you've got born-again people out there. Which means the church needs to be about evangelism and not about politics. Okay? Scott's little side box note there, okay? So, coming back to this. These individuals, they devoted themselves to prayer. And again, not just flippant, fly-by-night type prayer. They were devoted to the proclamation of the gospel. They were, pro they were devoted to the sanctification of the individuals, for the souls of individuals to become more and more like Christ Jesus. That is what they were focused on. They were not focused on all just the, the namby pamby kinds of prayer. Let me come back to Rainer. Rainer said this about that particular passage. He says, don't read too quickly past that word devoted. The, the word meaning has much intensity and deliberation. It is like a wild and hungry beast ready to devour its prey. When the early Jerusalem church members devoted themselves to prayer, they were doing a lot more than reading, name, reading names off of a list. They were fervent, intense, and passionate about prayer. Prayer was the lifeblood of the early church. Coming back to these autopsies, Rainer says these words. He says, one of the individuals closed this section with this testimony of his church. Here, here is what Tom wrote. He said, there was a day when prayer was powerful in our church. This was the, the testimony. There was a day when prayer was powerful in our church, he began. People would pray before the worship service. Small groups spent a lot of time in prayer. We prayed intently for our community. Then he stopped. It was like a light went on. Then our community started changing. He spoke methodically and slowly. We were afraid. Many members sold their homes and got out as quickly as they could. We started focusing on the fear. We stopped serving the community and tears welled in his eyes he started again and we stopped praying with passion that we once had that's it that was the beginning of the decline that led to our death we stopped taking prayer seriously and the church started dying Rainer writing about this says, no prayer, no hope. And the church started dying. You heard me at the very beginning of the mention that in January we, were, we had 21 days of prayer. We do 21 days of prayer in conjunction with the Church of the Highlands every, every year. We've been doing this. It's like our third or fourth year doing this. We do 21 days of prayer in January and we do 21 days of prayer in August. Today is day one of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Right now in the sanctuary, we are having issues with our internet. So as a result, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is exactly what happened in January too. So tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we will not be in the sanctuary here at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We will be in the conference room, okay? And if more of you start showing up, we'll figure out something else to do, all right? But we're going to have the service in the, sanctu I mean, in the conference room for the 21 days of prayer and fasting. So starting tomorrow and until the internet in here gets fixed, we will be in there. And so we start at 7 a.m., it goes to 8. It is one hour long, okay? So Monday through Friday, 7 a.m., and then on Saturday, it is at 10 a.m. Monday through Friday, 7, Saturday at 10. It's a one-hour service. And there's a, what we do is there's a time of worship, 
of singing songs, and then there's a time of some, some brief teaching on prayer, and then there's actually like 25 minutes of private individual prayer. If you are not able to make it to the live service on Facebook, we will put up the link afterwards of the replay. The replay lasts 24 hours, basically. You have just like, maybe it's like 23 hours or something like that, but it's, you have just before the service the next morning to watch the replay. And then it goes away. Now, when it's all done and done, they put them all back up later on, but, but during the 21 days, it's, it's, a 20, it's a 24 hour link on that thing, okay? And so that's every single day. If you are not able to come here, but you are able to do it live, we also put the link for the live link at the time on Facebook, okay? We can't do it on YouTube. We don't have that capability, but on Facebook, we do. So you can see it on our church's Facebook stuff. You also can see it on our church's website as well. Uh, there's always a link there that we put up for it as well, okay? So that starts today. So this is, that's what we're going to do. Right now, we're going to end this section, and the next two sections of the sermon are going to be much, more, much quicker. But let me, let me, every single section ends with, with a prayer commitment, and I'm going to read the prayer commitment from Tom, and then I'm going to just enter into like a season of prayer for us as a church. And then we'll go and we'll conclude the service with these next two points and those will go much more quickly. So here's the prayer commitment that Tom, prayed or Tom Rainer wrote regarding this subject of prayer. He said, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray consistently. Teach me to be a leader in prayer in my church and teach me to keep passionate and believing prayer as the lifeblood of this church. Father, we do come into your presence. We come into your presence as your children, as your sons and your daughters, knowing that we have the full assurance that if we ask anything in your name, that you hear us. That it's not writing a letter to a Santa Claus in the sky, it's not praying to a genie in the bottle, but that you are very real, that you are very dynamic, that you are the one who intervenes in human history, that you have not abandoned us, you have not forsaken us, that literally the Holy Spirit indwells us, pricks our heart, appoints for us what we ought to pray, and then under obedience and, and just under your inspiration, we raise it back out and we cry it back out to you with the assurance that you hear us. And Lord, when we come to those times when we don't know the words to pray, that we know that the Holy Spirit moans and groans with words that we can't utter. And he ministers on our behalf in those times of intense brokenness. And Father, I am grateful that we get to come before you and to, and to pray for people in their, their different needs that they have. Father, I'm grateful that, like, like for example, school starts this week. And we can, we, can, we can pray for our teachers. Lord God, I pray that you would raise up godly teachers, godly men and women within our school systems whether they be administrators, whether they be bus drivers, whether, whether they be kitchen staff, whether they be janitorial staff, whether they actually be teachers, whether they work in the office, whether they're counselors, whether, whether they're deans, it doesn't make a difference. Father, whatever role the individuals have within our school systems, Father, we pray that you would raise up godly men and women and that those who are indeed born again, that they would be witnesses not just to the students but also to their, their peers, to their coworkers, to their colleagues. Because what we need are men and women who know Christ Jesus and who will teach the truth and teach boldness and will encourage the students to then also be bold amongst their peers. So Father, raise up these teachers. Raise up these administrators. Raise up these school workers. And Father, I do pray for our students. Obviously, we live in a world of, of sin and degradation. We live in a world of depravity. And these kids face, they face temptations, they face ridicule, they face persecution. Like, like I don't, it never happened when I was a kid like this. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't like it is now. And so, Father, I pray for those kids. I pray for them regarding social media. I pray for them regarding entertainment. I pray for them regarding just the, 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 the dating relationships. Every aspect. Father, I lay these things before them and, and, and pray that you would raise up within them, that you'd raise a generation of, of young boys and girls, young teenagers, who would actually be steadfast in their faith and say, it does not matter what, what my friends do. It doesn't matter even what my church friends do. I will stand with Christ and Christ alone. 
And I will be bold for my, for my faith. And when opposition comes, it does not matter. I would rather have no friends and have Jesus than have all the friends and know Jesus. So Father, I pray you'd raise them up. Give them that, that, that backbone like you gave Jeremiah, which was like a rod of steel. So that when the nations tried to, to push on Jeremiah, he did not bend. That it literally, in that 20th chapter, he talks about how there was, it was literally like fire in his bone. It was shut up in his bones. That he could not help but proclaim the truth. Beloved, we need that kind of same kind of fervency, that same kind of passion here, and not just in our school systems. Father, I pray that same thing even here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. It is not an issue of age. It is not an issue of, of economic status. It is not an issue of ethnicity. It is an issue of are we yours? And Father, I pray that you'd raise First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, and not just First Baptist Bowling Green, but all the churches in Hardy County, all the churches in the state of Florida, all the churches in the United States, all the churches around the world. Father, raise up true, faithful men in God. Awaken us from our slumber. Help us to fall in love with Christ Jesus as we have never fallen in love with him before. And out of that, may we have that rod of steel. May we see the world with your eyes. May we hear the world with your ears. And may we then speak to the world as you would speak to them. And help the world to see their absolute need, that they are headed to a lake of fire, separated from the mercy and grace of your love. And that their only hope, there is no other name by which they can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Give them that, 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 that kind of understanding. Father, we pray as to the Holy Spirit that you, would, that you would put harvest workers in their path. And that we would be those harvest workers. And we're not just praying for harvest workers, but that we would actually be those harvest workers. So, Father, raise up harvest workers. Because that field, it is white unto harvest. They want to know Christ. They want to know salvation. Probably no other time in human history has spirituality been such a hot topic. Everybody's talking about spirituality. And yet they are choosing anything and everything and they've, they've made it a, an amalgamation of any kind of faith will do. Whatever's good for you is good for you. And Father, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. And they need to know the truth, that there's only one name that they can call on. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by Him. And so, Father, raise us up. And then, Father, not only do we pray that you'd raise up harvest workers, we'd also pray that your Holy Spirit use the Word of God to convict them of their heart. That your Holy Spirit would actually do the, the, the saving and convicting work within the souls of these individuals. Our job is to walk in obedience. Our job is not to be the ones that save them. You are the Savior. We are just the spokespeople. We are the ambassadors of the gospel of reconciliation. So, Father, let us indeed do that. God, we need you desperately. We desperately need you. And Father, even, even, even in this same kind of rain, talking about just these students, Father, you know that we as a church have been praying for, for an associate pastor over student ministries. Father, we, I don't know all the reasons. I, I know what the world says, and I know what others have said, but they are not the author and finisher of our faith nor of our decisions. We are told to walk in obedience to you. And so, Father, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that you have called somebody specifically for First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. And I'm praying that this is the year. This is the year of breakthrough. So, Father, you, you, whatever, if there's obstacles, if there's something that's been hindering the process, Father, you move those obstacles. You clear the way. You make it abundantly known as to who is supposed to be here. Father, our, our, not, our search committee, we, we've done all that. We, we've, we've sent out the request for resumes. And, Lord, right now, it's like the, the, the pool is dried up. We don't know why. We don't even necessarily know what to do next. And so, just because we have limited knowledge, just because we have limited understanding, doesn't mean that you do. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Your ways are greater than our ways. And you can certainly think beyond anything that we can ever think because you are infinite and we are finite. And so we lay even this issue before you and say, Father, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. You tell us to ask, so we are asking. Give us wisdom. And then give us the boldness and the clarity to understand what you are saying. And then to walk in it. 
Father, we need you. We know that you've never left us. We know that you've never forsaken us. But a lot of times, we, in all of our stuff, we muddy it up. And so we are asking that if we, if we are the ones that are hindering this process in any way, Father, reveal it to our hearts that we might repent. Just like you were, like you were telling the church of Ephesus there in the book of Revelation, repent. You have lost your first love. Repent. In fact, you said it two times. Repent. And return back to the things that you knew you were supposed to do. Father, may we at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green repent and return back to the things that we know we are supposed to do. And may we, even this evening, as we go into these laundromats, Father, I would rather have us go into those laundromats and not have the plan prepared perfectly and do what we can than to not go at all. So, Father, stir within your children the desire and the necessity to go and proclaim it, even if we do it imperfectly. I'd rather do it imperfectly than sit here in our, in our seats and on our duffs and, mellow, and, and, and bur- bicker and complain and murmur and gripe. Let us be in doing something for your glory. And then see the heart in which we do it. And may our hearts truly be pure. May our hearts truly be one of desiring for you to be glorified. Father, move in this place. Move in our hearts. And and Lord, over these next 21 days, over these next 21 days, may you give us insight. This breakthrough that we're praying for, may you bring breakthrough over these next 21 days. May we pursue you every day. And Father, for, 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 for some in here, they've never fasted before. Father, may you prick their heart and say, start fasting something. Skip a dinner. Skip a lunch and a dinner. Skip a day. Father, start moving on their hearts. Teach them how to incorporate fasting into their life that they might pursue you more in each of those moments. Father, be glorified. Father, speak to us now as we continue this sermon. Move in a mighty passion. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, rapidly, we've got to wrap these last two up pretty quickly. Number nine. Number nine. The church had no clear purpose. Now this one is very similar to that they were preference driven. Now this is the church that didn't even have a purpose. They they'd had no clear purpose. Churches that grew clearly understood their purpose. They clearly understood how to carry out their purpose. That is certainly not the case with those churches that were dying. The interviewees of the deceased churches referenced, referred to their last years in sad and similar ways. They said, we were going through the motions Everything we did seemed to be like we were in a rut or a bad routine. We became more attached to our ways of doing church than we did asking the Lord what he wanted us to do. I don't know if these are hitting you the way they hit me, but these break my heart every single time I read one of them. Because I find this true in my own personal life, let alone us as a church corporately. We were playing a game called church. We had no idea what we were really supposed to be doing. And the last one, we stopped asking what we should be doing for fear that it would require too much effort or change. I'm going to read that one again. We stopped asking what we should be doing for fear that it would require too much effort or change. If we do not put in effort and we do not change, we will just continue to get sicker and sicker until we die. That's the point. We are not talking about changing the gospel. We are talking about changing the methodology. None of the members asked what they should be doing. They were too busy doing what they've always done. Rainer takes us to Philippians chapter 1. 
And in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we read these words. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. And here it is. Here's why. Verse 5. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Because of your preparation and participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Remember, Paul is in prison when he's writing this. And, th- and people talk, this is, the, this is the book that talks more about joy than any other book. And Paul is in prison. Why does Paul have such great joy in the midst of being shackled up to these guards other than the fact that he's getting to preach to these guards all the time? Because the gospel is going forth even in his absence from Philippi. From their participation in the gospel from the first day until now, so he hasn't stopped giving thanks and being full of joy because of this. The dying churches at some point in their history forgot their purpose Rarely could anyone, this is sad, blood, but listen to this. Rarely could anyone point to a singular event or a historical moment where the purpose was forgotten. It was deadly, and it was a deadly and slow process. Attitudes shifted from gospel centeredness and other centeredness to self centeredness. An outward focus became an inward obsession. And routines and traditions and rituals replaced the original purpose of being a gospel driven church. A church without a gospel-centered purpose is no longer a church at all. Beloved, last week I, I held up the, 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 those little business cards that we have in the back. And I said, look, if you can't do anything else, at least go out there and invite somebody to church. And granted, what I'd rather have you do is I'd rather have you give your testimony and engage in spiritual conversations. Be listening as you're at work, as you're in the neighborhood, as you're at the grocery store, wherever you are. Listen for the spiritual conversation shifts. And when you hear the spiritual conversation shift and they say things that are spiritual in nature, this is your invitation. You don't have to ask the Father. And so, God, is this the moment? It already is evident. The conversation turned to a spiritual thing. And, they, and it's anything can be said to move it that way. These are your moments. Be aware of it. Be praying. Lord, help me to hear as you would hear. Help me to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit's promptings. And then to engage. And if you can't actually give the testimony and engage in those moments, at least say, hey, hey, look, I got a business card. Hey, you know, I noticed you said that. Would you at least be willing to come to church with me? I'll even take you to lunch afterwards. And we get out at 1130 so we beat the Methodists to church. In fact, Methodists started coming to us because of that, right? That's not true. That's not true. But that, so give them a card. Just give them a business card, okay? Here's the prayer commitment for this. God, reignite the hearts of our church members, including me, to have a passion for the gospel. Teach our church to share the gospel with others. Teach us to live as men and women who are true uh, believers or bearers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Remind us of our purpose. Convict us of our purpose. Empower us to live our purpose. Amen. And here's the final one. This is the last evidence of a deceased or dying church. The church obsessed over the facilities. The church obsessed over the facilities. Now, beloved, that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to take care of our facilities. Obviously, every one of you are enjoying this air condition that was not working this morning. So every one of you guys that got that working this morning, Brandon and Junior, and I don't know even who else I saw out there. There was like 15 people working on the ACs that looked, seemed like this morning. Thank you for getting them up and running. We're not talking about just letting the facilities de- you know, become dilapidated. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is when it became the obsession about the facilities over the ministry. That's what we're talking about. Coming back to Rainer, he says, the, 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 he's referencing specifically, he's referencing one specific church that had a room called the Lydia Room. I have no idea what they did in the Lydia Room because he doesn't really go into the details of it. But here's what was said about these things. The room would become the focus of dissension. Who could use it? Who decided what furniture went in there? Could people outside the church use it? Could a normal church fellowship be held there? Now that's real sad when you can't even let church fellowships be held in the Lydia room, okay? One interviewee said this. 
And here's why I'm telling you this. This is, this is why I'm reading this part to you. One of the interviewees said this about that, that situation. We were fighting over a stupid room while the church died. By the way, I'm back to this particular church with this Lydia. Um, later on, they also had to have, they, they, they were changing out the pulpit. And there was the, those that wanted the new pulpit and those that wanted the old pulpit. And the old pulpit people actually went out and brought people who had, never, who had not been in church in years but were members of the church and still had voting rights in that church because of it. Brought them in to fight against the new pulpit. Now the new pulpit people won and guess what happened to all those people that showed up for the vote only? Were they there the very next week? No, they hadn't been in church in years. By the way, the church died. Some churches became obsessed with memorials. The point is not the memorials themselves. The point is that memorials become an obsession at many of these churches. More and more emphasis was placed on the past and the future was neglected. Rainer takes us to Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, we read these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Rainer's whole point is that these churches were so focused on their treasure of their church, they forgot about the eternal treasures of souls. And when that becomes our focus, that is detrimental. Rainer says, a church that has lost her eternal focus is one step closer to dying and death. And here is his final prayer. Lord, teach me the proper stewardship of all the material items you give me personally and in my church. Help me never let that stewardship evolve into obsession and idolatry, especially where I lose my perspective on what really matters. Amen. Well, I don't know if you caught that last part. But he said, don't ever let my stewardship evolve into obsession and idolatry, where, especially where I lose my perspective on what really matters. Beloved, a lot of the stuff that we get upset about and a lot of the stuff that we become obsessed about don't mean a hill of beans. And I'm not saying this about First Bowling Groom, but I mean like there's churches, they split over whether it's pews or, or, or chairs. Whoopee D. It's a place to put your bottom for an hour or so. Who cares? It's not about pews. It's not about seats. It's not about pulpits. It's not about tables. It's not about lights. It's not about drums or guitars. It is all about Jesus. That's exactly right, Eddie. Amen. What is our focus, beloved? And by the way, your actions, your actions prove what you really believe you can t let me do it from an earthly perspective okay you can tell me you believe in investing your money for retirement but if you don't put anything in investments what are you telling me about your belief about investments you don't believe you know, in the evangelism explosion, we do this whole thing about sitting in a chair. You can tell me that you believe in sitting in chairs and that this will hold you up. But until you actually sit down in the chair, you do not prove you believe it. You can tell me you believe in the gospel, but if you've never shared your faith, then you do not. Dying churches get to the place that they do not do what they say they believe. They are believers in words only, but not in action. And what does the New Testament tell us about that? If you know the thing you ought to do and you do not do it, you sin. Do we really believe the truth? We're going to have a time of invitation. And yes, we've talked about the gospel 
And the gospel is basically, it's good news that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died for your sins and for mine. And if you've never cried out and said, hey, Lord Jesus, please save me. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm headed straight to the pits of hell and I need a savior. If that's you today, you can come down. If you're watching online later on this week, once it goes up, you can just write in the comments, let us know so we can reach out and minister to you. But the gospel really is, it's available. It's just, it's just crying out, Jesus, save me a sinner. That's how simple it is. And if you've never done that and you want to do that during the service, you can do it. But if this sermon, this, these last three weeks, as we're talking about being honest about our situation, if it has pricked your heart, then I'm asking you, come pray. Come to these steps that we call altars and be praying, God, change my heart. Change my heart and well, awaken within me the desire to actually be about your business. And again, there's no retirement in the scriptures. Your hair color is irrelevant to Jesus. Your energy level is irrelevant to Jesus. He's asking you to walk in obedience. And so like tonight when we go to the laundry mats, if you can't actually physically go, you can be in here praying until the Bible study happens. And you can be praying for those that are out there going. We're asking you to step out and partner with us in going towards the lost whether they come here or not, whether we do it perfectly or not, let us be about proclaiming the gospel. As I pray, may the praise team come. Lord, Lord, move in this place. Move in this place. You, we know your spirit's here because you've never left us. You live within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, Father, let us indeed honor you with our very bodies, with, which includes our tongue to speak, which includes our ears to hear, which includes our eyes to see, which includes our heart, which shows our motives. Father, you've told us that we are new creations, that the old is gone, that the new has come. Father, let us start living life in the newness of who we are. And Father, if we have forgotten the vigor and the passion and the joy of our salvation, Father, we bring it back to our minds. Bring it back to our hearts. Help us to believe in you and show that belief by our actions. To your glory, Father, move. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.